Well, some of the brightest minds in the world are fans of books by our next guest, myself included. Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari explored the past and future of humanity in his books Sapiens and Homo Deus. They became international bestsellers with more than 12 million copies sold worldwide. His books were also praised by a wide range of thought leaders, including former President Barack Obama, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sir Richard Branson. In his new book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Harari focuses on the present and dissects the most pressing issues facing humanity. You've all know Harari. Good morning. Great to have you on. Congratulations on the book. So much of what we're talking about now and in the future is based on technology and AI. And a big mm -hmm. question many people have is, will AI help us as a race? Will they help us as a society? Or will AI lead to our downfall? Well, that depends on our question, on, on, on what we do with it. Yeah. I mean, technology is not deterministic. You can build very different societies with the same technology, just as you could use trains and electricity and radio to build uh, communist dictatorships or fascist regimes or liberal democracies in the 20th century. Yeah. So also in the 21st century, you can use AI and biotechnology to build paradise or hell. It's up to us. And what about the jobs, though? I mean, the, the, one of the stories leading up to uh, this interview was about the need to retrain workers mm -hmm. and the, the feared loss of jobs due to automation. What, what can we expect in, in decades to come when it comes to jobs? Well, we can expect two things. I mean, the job market will completely change. And much of the struggle that people will have will be against irrelevance and not exploitation. Yeah, you said there's a real risk that we could create a massive useless class of people. Yeah, that's the biggest risk, that many people will lose completely their economic value and therefore also their political power. Now, there will be, of course, new jobs. Some jobs will disappear, many jobs will disappear, many jobs will emerge. The big question is whether people will be able to retrain and reinvent themselves in time and whether they can do it again and again and again. Because if you have a 50, 60 year career, as life expectancy also increases, you will have to do it not just once. Yeah. I mean, some people think that the AI revolution will be some big event following which the job market will settle into a new equilibrium. But this is very unlikely. The AI revolution will likely be a cascade of ever bigger disruptions. So you will have to reinvent yourself repeatedly. And here the biggest question, the, the biggest problem may be psychological. Yes. Whether people have the mental ability to reinvent themselves at age 40 and again at 50 and again at 60. And you say we're not, we're not teaching, we're not preparing kids for this in school. No, not at all. I mean, most of what kids learn today in school will probably be irrelevant by the time they are 40 or 50. And we don't really know what to teach them because nobody knows how the job market or the world would look like in 2050. It's maybe the first time in history we have no idea whatsoever how the job market would look like in, in, in 30 years. Yeah. So the, the best bet is to focus on emotional intelligence and mental stability and mental resilience. And how do you suggest people do that? I don't know. You meditate. <laughs> you, you, you meditate every day. That's one of the ways yeah, you do. I meditate. I do vipassana meditation two hours a day. I go for a 60 days retreat every two year. Two hours a day. Yeah, and, and because of that, I know how difficult it is. And it's not easily scalable. And it's much more difficult to teach emotional intelligence or mental resilience mm -hmm. than to teach physics equations or to teach uh, history or, or whatever. And we don't have the tools at present to scale up this kind of teaching. So most of what we see in most schools is just inertia. We do what was relatively okay in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. We're still, I mean, your point is we're still kind of stuffing kids full of information that they now can get pretty easily themselves. What we, what we need to do is teach them how to evaluate that information. That's part of the thing. And it's not what I say. It's, it's almost all experts on, on education would agree. Information is the last thing the kids need. Mm. They have far too much of it anyway. Yeah. And censorship today works in a very different way. In the past, 
censorship worked by blocking the flow of information. And information was very valuable. Yeah. Today, censorship works by flooding people with enormous amounts, not just of disinformation. Conflicting but simply information. Of, yeah, conflicting information yeah. and simply irrelevant information. And one of the questions you raise is who's going to own that information and who's going to be owning that data in the future as well? Yeah, that's maybe the biggest political question. I mean, in, in ancient times, land was the most important asset in the economy. So politics was the struggle to control land. In the last 200 years, machines replaced land as the most important economic asset. So politics became the struggle to control the machines. And now data is replacing machines as the most important asset. So politics is really a struggle about who owns and who controls the flows of data in the world. So much to think about. Yuval Noah Harari, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 21 Lessons for the 21st Century goes on sale tomorrow.